Whether routine procedures or emergency situations, you are exposed to patients as you assist in or perform their care. Your job may involve transporting materials used to provide care, such as sheets or vials of bodily fluid, or you may be a direct provider who comes into contact with patients' bodies on a regular basis. Many routine medical tasks and certainly emergency response scenarios bring with them a risk for exposure to bloodborne pathogens. OSHA defines bloodborne pathogens as infectious microorganisms that are present in human blood and can cause disease in humans. The potentially life-threatening pathogens include, but are not limited to, the hepatitis B and C virus, often referred to as Hep B and Hep C, along with the human immunodeficiency virus, better known by its acronym HIV. Both hepatitis B and C affect the liver and can cause illnesses that last a few weeks. However, 15% of Hep B and more than 50% of Hep C infections lead to potentially fatal conditions, such as cirrhosis or liver cancer. HIV attacks the body's immune system and destroys disease-fighting cells. It can cause the disease known as Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, AIDS, for which there is no cure. As a healthcare worker, your risk for exposure to these bloodborne pathogens is well above the norm. In this training, you will learn more about your personal risk and how to minimize that risk. We will also explore the role and responsibilities employers play and what to do in the event of exposure. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates 5.6 million workers are at risk of occupational exposure to bloodborne pathogens. Are you one of them? Do you come into contact with patients or materials that have been used to treat them? From bed sheets to bandages, bloodborne pathogens may be present. For frontline healthcare personnel such as nurses, doctors, hospice workers, hygienists, home healthcare workers, emergency medical technicians, laboratory specialists, Whatever your role, you come into direct contact with patients' bodies, and often their bodily fluids. Even if you rarely come into contact with a patient, but are instead transporting materials that have been in contact with or used to treat them, your risk of exposure is heightened. Every healthcare setting is different. These range from emergency response units, small clinics, in-home care, large hospitals, dental offices, mobile clinics, and more. Healthcare is a huge industry that employs millions of people, you being one of them. Consider your own career. What exposure do you have to bloodborne pathogens? Do you see broken skin or place your fingers inside of patients' mouths or other mucous membranes? Perhaps you're involved in the extraction, transportation, or laboratory analysis of blood samples. Are accidental needle sticks a concern? What about bites from your patients? Saliva, stool, urine, and other bodily fluids all have the potential to carry bloodborne pathogens. Collectively, these risk sources are known as Other Potentially Infectious Materials, or OPIM. Small cuts and abrasions may not be visible. Cells, tissues, and organs from humans or even animals that are involved in the healthcare process may be infected. In many cases, you might never see the blood involved in transmission. This is why having an awareness of risk and how to minimize occupational exposure to these pathogens is so crucial. Have you ever grabbed a freshly brewed cup of coffee or tea and immediately taken a large gulp? It's more likely you assumed the drink was too hot for that and instead first took an experimental sip to gauge the temperature. You could say this is a standard precaution you take to avoid scalding the inside of your mouth. An estimated 75% of Hep C and 15% of HIV cases go undiagnosed. Since many people carry bloodborne pathogens with no symptoms and don't even know they are carriers, the CDC has recommended its own standard for approaching bloodborne pathogen exposure risk. Just as you presume your beverage is too hot and you handle it with special care to avoid scalding yourself, these universal precautions dictate that 
all blood and other potentially infectious materials should be treated as if they carry pathogens. Universal precautions have been expanded and rebranded as standard precautions to include additional OPIM hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, and safe injection practices. This assumption of danger leads to more carefully designed procedures and built-in protections in healthcare settings. Speaking of danger, have you ever been to a snake habitat exhibit? Just behind a few millimeters of glass, venomous creatures watch you cautiously. What protects you from them or them from you, the physical glass barrier is an example of an engineering control measure. Engineering controls are those that are integrated directly into the physical environment through either removal of a hazard or placement of a barrier between potential victims and those hazards. Said another way, they are products and equipment that can eliminate or minimize your workplace exposure. What types of engineering controls might help keep you safe in your tasks? You must first have a clear understanding of the hazards involved, preferably through well-informed and well-developed job hazard analyses that break down tasks across hazards and how to avoid them. These JHAs should be part of your employer's exposure control plan which we'll explore later in this training. Once you and the decision makers at your organization are fully aware of the dangers of your work environment, steps can be taken to integrate in the appropriate engineering controls. In the medical field, engineering controls to limit exposure to bloodborne pathogens might include containers, signage and labels, enclosures from machines used for specimen separation and analysis, such as with centrifuges and in gas chromatography, and barriers that limit access to areas for non-medical personnel. Consider the everyday danger of cuts or stabs from sharp objects in the healthcare setting. Contaminated sharps include any contaminated object that can penetrate the skin, including but not limited to needles, scalpels, broken glass, broken capillary tubes, and exposed ends of dental wires. Safer controls can help limit risk. What engineering controls would you employ? Effective choices would include the use of proper sharps disposal containers and moving to the use of self-sheathing needles, injury protection sharps, and needleless systems. For protection against exposure to bloodborne pathogens in general, appropriate containers must be used for storing, transporting, shipping, or disposing of blood or other potentially infectious materials. These containers must be marked by the biohazard symbol on a red or red-orange background. Engineering controls cannot be optimally effective without the proper administrative controls in place. Administrative or work practice controls seek to decrease the danger from hazards by introducing procedures, policies, training, and sound practices into the work culture. Administrative control measures go a long way in communicating workplace expectations. These controls are aimed at eliminating or at least minimizing an individual's risk of exposure. Consider again your own workplace. What practices should be in place to protect you, your coworkers, and your patients? There are many administrative controls aimed at minimizing risk of exposure to bloodborne pathogens. For example, in areas where possible exposure exists, employees and patients should not eat, drink, or otherwise risk contamination to their mucous membranes, like applying cosmetics or handling contact lenses or any sores or open wounds they may have. Along the same lines, would you place food or drinks in refrigerators and freezers or on countertops and shelves where blood and other potentially infectious materials are kept? Hopefully not. This would present an easy entry point for pathogens into your body's system. What other administrative controls could you employ? How about avoiding what's known as the recap mishap? Never bend, break, recap, or remove contaminated sharps. You should know the location of the sharps disposal container before you use a needle. Nearly one-third of all sharps injuries occur during disposal. 
always follow proper procedures for handling and disposing of contaminated specimens, laundry, and other potentially contaminated items. The use of personal protective equipment, or PPE, is considered an administrative control. Be sure to wear gloves when handling any blood or other potentially infectious material. Spills can be cleaned using a bleach dilution of one part bleach to 10 parts water, or an EPA-registered disinfectant specifically proven effective against bloodborne pathogens. This is not only for recently contaminated materials or surfaces either. The Hep B virus, for example, can live outside of the body for up to seven days. Always assume a bloodborne pathogen is present and active. When storing, washing, decontaminating, or disposing of PPE, place used items in designated containers. Be sure to wash your hands thoroughly as soon as PPE is removed. Healthcare has a long history. Unfortunately, most engineering and administrative controls were born out of mistakes made and tragedies experienced by others in the past. This does mean that the controls and workplace expectations in place for healthcare workers are sound, well-informed, and meant to protect everyone involved. Still, if you have suggestions for improved controls for your own workplace, inform your coworkers and supervisor, and consider if a procedure specific to your work should be adopted, or if additional engineering controls should be integrated into your work environment. What good are administrative controls that are never enforced, and engineering controls that are not reviewed and properly maintained? Employers are responsible for complying with OSHA's Bloodborne Pathogen Standard whenever employees have reasonably anticipated occupational exposure to blood and other potentially infectious materials. Ensuring adherence to engineering and administrative controls, including the standard precautions discussed earlier, is key to approaching compliance. Part of this compliance also includes creation of a written exposure control plan. An exposure control plan includes a list of jobs with potential exposures and their procedures. OSHA requires this plan to be made accessible to all employees. It must also be reviewed and updated annually. Each update must document input from non-managerial employees who can offer valuable frontline perspectives research of current market availability for new engineering controls, and a review of administrative controls. Do these procedures sound familiar to you? If not, ask your supervisor to help you fill in some blanks. Your healthy curiosity and diligence may make all the difference, despite the responsibility for these aspects of compliance resting mainly with your employer. Employers are also responsible for offering all new employees a free hepatitis B vaccine within 10 days of their initial job assignment. Unfortunately for Hep C or HIV, there is currently no vaccine to prevent infection. In addition to offering the Hep B vaccine, OSHA requires employers to provide, repair, clean, and replace PPE as necessary. This should be done at no cost to workers. Relevant personal protective equipment includes eye protection, gloves, gowns, and lab coats, and also face, head, and foot coverings. These PPE items play a crucial role in protection against infection from bloodborne pathogens. Along with providing these protections, employers are required to maintain medical records and a Sharps injury log. Lastly, training such as this one is a major component of ensuring employee safety. Employers will provide training when an employee is first assigned to a job, each subsequent year, and when new or modified tasks are implemented. Employers are also required to maintain training records. This training is a testimony to your employer's commitment and your own to building a culture of compliance, safe work, and protection against bloodborne pathogens and other potentially infectious materials. There is no way to fully eliminate your chance of exposure to bloodborne pathogens. If you are potentially exposed, you should wash your hands and other affected skin with soap and water immediately. If your eyes, nose, or mouth were splashed or cut, flush them with water. Once you have cleansed these areas, immediately report any exposure or suspected exposure to your supervisor. Your employer will need to create an exposure incident record 
documenting the incident location, procedure, your level and history of training, and the controls and PPE that were used. The name of the individual who potentially passed on the virus will also be included unless prohibited by law in your area. Remember how you should have been offered a free hepatitis B vaccine within 10 days of your initial job assignment? Since even post-exposure hepatitis B vaccines can prove effective at preventing hep B infection and later chronic infection or liver disease, your employer should again offer a free hepatitis B vaccine if you decline the first time it was offered. They should also offer to arrange a free post-exposure evaluation, follow-up, and counseling. Be sure to see your physician and get tested. If an infection is detected, treatment should immediately be started. Your physician may refer you to specialty services and may also recommend a treatment of hepatitis B immune globulin for additional protection. The evaluating healthcare professional will provide your employer with a limited, strictly confidential opinion in writing. Do you know the symptoms of Hep B, C, and HIV? Given your workplace proximity to the risk of bloodborne pathogen exposure, you should continuously be on the lookout for symptoms. Both hepatitis B and C express themselves as some or all of the following symptoms. Fever and fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea and or vomiting, abdominal or joint pain, dark urine, clay-colored stool, and jaundice. Only 30 to 50% of people with hepatitis B who are five years of age or older will develop symptoms. People with a hepatitis C infection who do develop symptoms will typically notice them two to 12 weeks after exposure. Similarly, the symptoms of HIV typically occur within two to four weeks after exposure, although it may take much longer than this time period for any infection to express itself. Do not assume you're in the clear simply because you have passed a certain time frame beyond the suspected exposure event. When they do appear, HIV symptoms may include fever and or chills, rash, night sweats, muscle aches, sore throat, fatigue, swollen lymph nodes, and mouth ulcers. Don't notice any of these symptoms? Always stay diligent in watching for the signs of infection and get tested as recommended by your physician. The earlier the exposure and infection are identified, the better your chances to obtain timely, appropriate, and effective treatment. In the meantime, unless you're advised otherwise by your doctor, get a hepatitis B vaccine to protect yourself from infection. Since no vaccines currently exist for hepatitis C or for HIV, you should get tested as frequently as is reasonable and physician advised based on your exposure risk. Hep C treatments can cure most new infections within 8 to 12 weeks. HIV treatments are available that can help manage and control the infection, often within six months. If you ever are infected, you will thank yourself for being diligent in vaccination, testing, and symptom identification. As a healthcare worker, you're at heightened risk of exposure to bloodborne pathogens and subsequent infection. In this training, we explored the risks and also control and response strategies for dealing with potential exposure to these and other potentially infectious materials. Adapting these strategies to your unique healthcare working environment will help you and those for whom you provide care and with whom you work remain safe.